Welcome, everyone. This is Danny's Best Ever Real Estate Investor Mastermind. I am Slocum, your host for this, for this webinar this evening. We have Eric Kotner. I'm really excited uh, for you all to get the opportunity to learn from him. I, I expect I will learn from him uh, during the next hour or so as well. We, uh, doing this as a webinar, I want to make sure I have some questions planned some things for us to discuss, some, uh, some aspects of Eric's business from my knowledge of it, from being his, uh, his friend, that, that I think you guys will find really interesting and really valuable. There are some things that he's doing that he's having great success, success with that I don't know anyone else who's, who, who's, who's, who's doing this. Um, if you have questions, please use the Q&A function within the Zoom meeting. It should be towards the bottom center of your screen. Q&A will give you the opportunity to ask questions. I will get them uh, tracked in my notes for this conversation and make sure that your questions get answered. Uh, it may take a minute, I may wait until the end, but do feel free to ask questions using the Q&A function. So, Eric, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I'm in a full-time real estate investor since technically 2011. That's when I started fixing and flipping. Um, started with a few properties at a time and up until about a couple of years ago, um, you know, stayed pretty consistent. And this year, uh, last year I did about, uh, I'd say about six flips and then bought about a few rentals as well. This year I'm currently on track to do about 10 flips, um, and about 22 deals in total um, for that. 10 flips over the course of the year or just this thus year. far? Just this year. Gotcha. Cool. So, um, yeah, we've already sold off two. We have about eight in inventory, one of which went on the market uh, Friday and went pending as of two days ago. So it was pretty much on the market for two days. Yeah. Um, and we're about to get an offer on our condo as well. Um, and then we should have another one coming up here in a couple weeks. Um for that portion of it. So we have about eight flips going on currently. Um, I'm actually wholesaling one at the end of the month as well. Um, and yeah, still look, still looking to uh, buy a few more uh, during all this th time going on. So, but yeah, for the past few years, um, since 2011, I've been a full-time real estate investor um, and just been specializing in the fix uh, residential fix and flips. Nice. That's good stuff. So you have eight flips going on right now in what we hope is not the middle of a pandemic. We hope it's the end, but that's still just a hope. Uh, real quick question. Uh, you have eight single family homes being flipped right now. How many crews do you have working on those flips? I'm actually joint venturing with, with a general contractor uh, for about, technically five of them right now one of which just went pending um i'm partnering with him on and then i'm doing joint ventures with two other um investors as well uh for it so technically i could say i have three crews but i'm using in other investors um you know to kind of manage the projects and stuff like that that's a really interesting point you bring up let's talk about that tell me why do you jv with general contractors why, why tell us a little bit about how you structure your deals with, um, with GCs and then why you do it that way. Uh, well, I only have done it with one. So just kind of going out there, I pretty much over a course of years, I really like their quality of work and, you know, knowing how the market was going, every, uh, GC and sub was being picked up by new, uh, new developers and new builds and all that stuff as well. So normally the issue that happens in fix and flips is normally there's a GC you really like, and all of a sudden, you know, their prices start getting out of, you know, what you can do in a conventional rehab on it, just because they see the opportunity, they're going to go towards retail work on it. So I presented the idea to this GC that we just start doing joint ventures on it. They do it at cost. And then we split the profits um, on the back end. And we've had some really good deals where, uh, you know, a couple of, a couple of times we've netted about $15,000 each um, off these deals. And so essentially what happens is, you know, 
he does everything at cost. I maintain the cash flow. He always pretty much stays as a zero. Once it sells, uh, we split the profit on it. And because the fact is here, he has a core crew. And then I can always branch out to um, my sphere and be able to get special trades on there that has already used to working with us. Um, at that point, we can get we can pretty much make a seventy to eighty thousand dollar rehab, um, be about fifty to fifty five, um, very quickly. That's awesome. There. So just to make sure, profits on the flip, you're splitting them fifty fifty with your GC. Yeah, for for the hey. most part on. Uh, for the most part. Now, I will say this. If we do have a heavier rehab on it, um, I actually do give them the lion's share on it, depending on the type of rehab. So if we're talking about a full gut rehab, um, because he has an owner on his side, they, they, uh, it's two owners on their uh, GC crew on it. So there are projects out there that I, do, I take a third split on. Now, keep in mind, the third of the split on these are about $20,000 uh, splits each. Gotcha. Well. So, yeah. and essentially what, what that leads for me is at that point, they're managing the project, they're getting all the materials on site, they're coordinating absolutely everything goes on there. I just get the invoices and the photos of the updated work. I write them a check um, for that. And then essentially I just continue going on acquiring more properties and acquiring funding for deals. Yeah, we'll get to how you acquire properties here soon, uh, but you're the one finding, negotiating the deals getting them closed so that the GCs have something to work on and then they take it from there until it's ready to list. And then you take it back. Uh, actually we, uh, put it, we send it off to a realtor. So even though I am licensed, I also, uh, do a, I also have another realtor actually list the properties for us. Oh, okay. Awesome. Why do you do that? Uh, it's, it's just all about kind of knowing where you, where you specialize and where you think you're good at. Um, I do not have a good patience for retail uh, real estate to be on the retail side. Um, and I just realized that my mind thinks way too much business to business. So like when, when you're on that B to uh, B to C side, business to consumer, you just can't switch off that mentality. So for me, my strength is not trying to negotiate why, you know, somebody missed a light bulb and, you know, a 20 item inspection list um, on there from these from people that, you know, want light bulbs or, you know, really small things that, you know, pop up in an inspection report. I don't have the patience for that. Yeah. If I could give our, uh, our attendees a summary of what I just heard you say, filtering it through my brain, uh, Eric has found what he's really good at in this business and that's finding the deals uh, and getting the deals negotiated. And at this point in his business, having those deals funded as well, uh, so he's in a position where having eight flips going on at a time right now is not that big of a deal because of the partnerships that he has, uh, and, uh, giving, being, being generous with his JCs, JV and giving them skin in the game because they're not making any money until this thing sells either. That puts him in a position where he can have eight flips going on at a time and they can all be profitable. So, so Eric has found, found his niche, found what he's good at. He's uh, willing to partner with people, compensate them fairly for the value that they bring to the deal. He is a licensed real estate agent. He's hiring a licensed real estate agent to list these for him because he knows that agent has a skill set better for the retail market than he does. This is all great stuff. Thank you for sharing all of that, Eric. So uh, pre uh, pre-March coming, coming b before we knew that it was pre COVID. Tell me what your business looked like, um, with regards to how many deals you, you typically had going on at a time. Uh, what kind of numbers you were looking for when you were flipping? So I came, I came into this, um, pre COVID, uh, currently working on about three flips. Um, with, with, uh, my GC partner on there. So essentially going into there, um, and we sold two off two of those off already. So since then we pretty much have been acquiring more properties. Um, it's really hard to say like what we have done differently, um, since that, because it's just been always business as usual for us, um, pre COVID when COVID hit, the biggest thing we kind of realized was, well, 
you know, our biggest worry was, are we going to get shut down? Like, are these projects going to get shut down and everything like that? So um, in one of our projects, we were applying for a permit, I think in December um, to finish the basement. And then essentially what happened was, you know, it took a way longer than usual for this permit to happen. And essentially because of COVID as well, it, it got stuck into where we just now received the permit back in July mm. for a finished basement for one of our projects. And that's been the only one as of right now that we've been holding since last year. Yeah. And so, with, with getting work permitted and talking about um, quarantines and shelter in place, it's not just you and your crew. It's not just the people who work in construction who may be considered uh, an essential business. It's also the government employees involved. Uh, my experience has been that when government employees uh, were sent home, there was not sufficient infrastructure in place to allow them to be productive working from home. And, and, and a lot of things got delayed. It sounds like you had a, you had a similar experience getting, getting that permit approved. Yeah. So um, on permits, we have definitely seen a long, uh, much longer delay. And now that everything has opened up again, we're seeing we're they're finally getting through the backlog of it. Um, now, because we're in Ohio, luckily during this time, they did consider realtors and agents and con and contractors essential workers. So essentially, what we did. So essentially, what we did was we kind of treated each house like an office, like an office setting of what he said to do. So we printed out the pages where it deemed contractors as essential workers, highlighted it, put it on the window like we do, like we would do with permits. Um, we put, we made sure that everyone had their own masks. We made sure that uh, hand sanitizer were on, son, on, on site. And then that way, if somebody like, you know, did want to come in and say, well, this isn't, you know, th this is not what was approved. We have the paperwork that states it was, we have the hand sanitizer, we have everything pretty much going up the standards of what they would have expected to see in a usual office setting um, during that time. So that's another big thing we kind of did uh, during that. Did you, a lot of, for a lot of people, for a lot of investors, the availability of contractors shifted during COVID. And for a lot of contractors, the availability of jobs shifted. Did you experience any of that? Or did you just have the same people doing the same work, plugging straight through because of the connections you have with your GCs? On our, on our side on there, we've just been pretty much plugging in with the same uh, people that we've been going with. Now, my, uh, my GC, on the other hand, you know, he's, he's picked on a couple more projects, like other than outside of what him and I do as well. And so he had a crunch from, I think, March up until about June, um, where he was having trouble. Um, out of our core group on there, there's pretty much two people that just wanted to stay, stay home um, during it um, for the first, like, month in April of it. And then they eventually came back to um, work with him. And then since, like, July and August, he's actually picked up, I think, it, I think since we last talked about three more people um, on the sub side that kind of help out with move, move work. So the odd part is like electricians, we picked up about two or three good crews of electricians. We're still struggling on plumbers, concrete people are like the biggest issue we've have found to date is concrete. Um, and from talking to other people right now as well, concrete has pretty much like gone up more than like 30% for all, for all their costs. And for everyone out there as well, material costs have also skyrocketed within the past couple of months as well. Um, pressure treated Supply chain issues. issues. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. With exactly what you're talking about. Supply, supply chain issues. Um, like pressure treated lumber is pretty much up like two or three times what the cost was before. Um, appliances are um, now probably up about 30 to 40% as well. And it takes forever to get any appliance delivered from anywhere. Yeah, I had I've, I've, I had I ordered a refrigerator from Home Depot in May that I forgot to cancel when I found someone else who could get it to me sooner and they ended up pushing it all the way back to August 21st from May the delivery of one refrigerator for which I was paying for delivery Oh my yeah, God. Cra crazy. I did get it canceled, but it's still crazy. Well, that's time. good. Right. Well, and, and the thing is, as well, like we're we're like in in the Westchester Home Depot. Like they know Adam, they know our company very well. We're probably like 
the third or fourth like top buyer for that uh, store. Um, and even even they tell us, hey, good luck trying to find appliances. So like there, I've found a couple websites on there. Um, I normally if I have a trouble with supplies, I usually go to their uh, their commercial side of Home Depot, which is hdsupplysolutions.com to to check out the appliances there. We can't order in packages, but you know, it seems like we still can order appliances from there. Yeah. Eric mentioned the Westchester Home Depot for those of you uh, attendees who are watching and listening in. Eric's uh, flips are primarily in Warren and Butler counties, right, Eric? Actually, um, a lot of them are in Hamilton County right now, um, but it is the suburbs. <laughs> we go back and forth about the city of Cincinnati. I'm on the, I, I'm on the east side. <laughs> yes. I. Uh, he, he and I invest in very different parts of the greater Cincinnati metro statistical area. We also live in yep. very different parts. Leave that for later, though. Uh, if yep. you have any questions, um, Eric understands Butler and Warren counties, especially the southern half of those two counties, intimately well, uh, and also some of the suburbs of Cincinnati in Hamilton County. For those of you ha who have any questions, feel free, jump in the Q&A and ask. Eric, from what you've said thus far, it sounds like you have more deals going on now that COVID has hit than you did before. Is that generally true? It is. It is true. And it's and it's very hard to kind of differentiate, like, you know, what, what is specifically COVID-based and what's just, you know, how we've been doing things. Because, um, you know, the beginning of this year, I wanted to get deals without doing a lot, without paying for marketing, like without paying any money towards marketing. And I can say that every deal that I have in, in inventory right now was without any money spent towards marketing at all. Um, so for me, it was pretty much getting connected with wholesalers, getting connected with other real estate agents. We found a good uh, cold oil banker agent that's been finding us a lot of the deals, you know, a lot of the deals that we got uh, through his connections. And then also me goofing off, just posting on our uh, Facebook page, uh, our turnkey renovations uh, Facebook page has actually got me two deals. So I, I'm probably one of the few people that say I got I got a deal off a GIF. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I don't know anybody else who's going to be able to say that. We're going to get to your use of GIFs uh, later. I will have plenty of questions about that. Jonathan, I want to say Somers or Somers has a question. Uh, he's, he's curious to know if there have been any issues with your GCs. Uh, prioritizing other projects over yours because they know they're getting a spread, whereas they're not getting a spread on the work they're doing for you and they have to wait uh, to profit until the end. Have you had that issue with GCs because of the way you structure your deals? With, with my one GC, I'm going to say not really because the way, the way we've had it timed out relative, like we're, we're, we're still in the weeds right now too, but we've been timing out with how everything's been going on it so essentially there have been times where if if we're still waiting on something to be able to do a big chunk of work um on it we're just going to wait until we get our materials needed we get what exactly what we need at that house and then we're going to go in and take two or three days and knock it out and so we've just been pretty much going around each of our other projects um doing that and knowing because of the backlogs that we've had with permits as well we've pretty much like had houses on on hold because of these permits as well where you couldn't do any work so oddly enough no because the fact is there's always some sort of delay in in some other house whether it's permits whether it's waiting for materials whether it's something else during the supply chain dis, um, disruption that we haven't seen that much of a uh, of a large gap that that could be specifically stated towards my contractor not being there gotcha Question from James, uh, paraphrasing, are you, uh, are you, how, how many of your deals proportionally are you finding the ones that you buy on the MLS? On the MLS, I think I've bought, let's see, Field Dirtle, Delcrest. I think I've bought three, three deals so far this year off the MLS. Three deals so far this year. Out of how many that you've bought? Uh, current, like,
like currently in inventory. Yeah, once they go out. Yeah, so I'd say about 12, 12% were MLS based, based on what I'm thinking of. 12% so, of what you bought. Yeah, so about 12% is the MLS. Um, and then like, and it's kind of hard to say, you know, these were MLS deals. These were deals that realtors brought me that were off market. So that's where I'm kind of having a, a little bit of an issue. So, gotcha. Deals realtors brought you. How many is that? Uh, I'd say probably about five or six. And what's the percentage? So double that 25, 30%. Gotcha. So 25, 30% of your deals are coming from realtors bringing them to you off market slash the MLS. Correct. I want to ask uh, how your metrics for your flips have changed since you got into COVID. So tell us, Eric, what, what were you looking for in a deal financially uh, before but pre COVID and then how has that changed given the way that you were, were projecting the market to move when COVID started and how you're projecting it now? Okay. So one of the main things that I, um, how I analyzed deals beforehand was, um, was I always wanted to stay between 150 to $300,000 and in the suburbs um, of Cincinnati. I like Butler and Warren County um, better than Hamilton County. Like Sulcum can tell you all about that. And that is um, 150 to 300 ARV or what the market ARV, value yes. should be at when you're listing it for sale, having completed the renovation, right? Yes, that is correct. 150 so, to 300. So the areas that I'm looking for right now in fix and flips hasn't changed because what I noticed during COVID on there is the people that kept their job and was working remotely are these people that live in the suburbs you know, within the, you know, corporate level jobs is the 150, 300. Those were the type of uh, areas that they were already living into, living and working in right now. And so essentially where I wanted to flip hasn't changed. Um, our metrics have definitely changed just because we don't know where, where exactly we're going to be going into right now. Um, over these past four years, just like with materials, houses have been the same way where people have been scared to list properties. So we've actually been seeing home values rise in the areas that we're currently flipping um, as well, which has always been a big benefit. Now, saying that, we've been averaging about 74 to 76% of um, where we're buying off of ARV. So where they teach you the 70% rule, we're, being, we're buying close to 75% around there. We're now shifting back into that 70% rule. And one of the deals we just currently got done um, in, Sharon, in, yeah, in Sharonville um, that I'm actually wholesaling off to another person, uh, we bought it at 70% and we um, are actually wholesaling it off to somebody around 60, 76% um, at that point. Now, granted, I knew who I was wholesaling it to begin with as well. Um, he owns his own, he owns his own um, construction company. And he also, um, earlier this year, we also did a joint venture flip together in Milford. So I knew exactly, you know, where, his, where he could get his margins on. And because he has a retail, you know, construction company going on right now, he has been busier than ever. So I knew that he had, he had money to burn and was looking for another project. So couple of things from what you just said. When Eric talks about 70% and moving up to 75 and moving back to 70, what, what he's talking about is uh, what the purchased and rehab costs will be as a percentage of the market value when he's done or the ARV after repair value. And so he's looking generally, the general rule of thumb uh, regardless of where we are in a market cycle is that house flippers want to be at 70%, meaning the money they spend getting the deal bought and getting the deal renovated ready for market will be 70% of what it should sell for. Uh, Eric, you normally operated, you said you were operating at 70 and then you moved up to 75 when COVID hit? No, no, no. Uh, reversed. Gotcha. Pre-COVID, I was around 75%. Now that now that COVID hit, um, I'm shifting back. I'm shifting it back to the seventy percent rule. Now, obviously, if it's still if it's in a good area that I know is going to be good, I'll 
I'll bend the rule a little bit on it and go a little bit percentage. But if it's an off market deal and I'm throwing the offer out there, I'm going to be aiming towards 70%. Gotcha. We have a couple of questions here uh, from Lance new to investing in Cincinnati. Uh, do you have any realtors you recommend to our investor friendly? There are quite a few. Um, <laughs> Eric and I are both realtors who are investors and investor friendly. There are a few more realtors who are investors and investor friendly among the attendees. My recommendation, Lance, and to the rest of you is to get into the Facebook group that corresponds with this meetup. Uh, you will be sent an email invitation to, um, to join that Facebook group because you registered for this webinar. That, that Facebook group of all the Facebook groups I'm in with investors in Cincinnati has been my go-to place for getting recommendations, feedback, asking questions, giving answers when I happen to be the knowledgeable one. Uh, to, to, to Lance, I, I recommend getting into the Facebook group uh, once you have been to this meetup. Uh, Nicholas Morgan is asking, have you ever used another realtor to pull comps for you to make sure that your, that your numbers looked right uh, or that your numbers were accurate? And if so, did you compensate them? I, I have not compensated a realtor for pulling comps mainly for the fact that I am a licensed realtor myself. When I say you f finding your strengths, I, my background is I did study accounting and I am very neurotic in analytics. That is where my strength is. So I will teach people, um, I will teach people, you know, kind of how I do my numbers on it. And um, even with my virtual assistant that I have, um, she's based out of Georgia and I think she's listening here. So I gotta be careful. Um, like I'm even teaching her how I run my comps right now. We, we use a mix of MLS and uh, we currently got PropStream as well um, to run our comps. And then obviously people that bring their own comps as well. We analyze. What is, Eric, what is PropStream? I'll be honest, I'm still not quite a hundred percent sure, but it's fun to play with. Um, essentially what it is, it's like a, it's like a, it's a, it's a data analyst, like software. So like, I know you can, I know you can run comps on it, uh, throughout the entire nation and stuff like that. And it pulls up MLS and public record. You can get, uh, you can help build out lists with it as well. So like you can build out like campaigns and pre foreclosures, high equity cash buyers and all that stuff with it. Um, I've literally have had it for about a month and a half. All I've been doing with it right now is pretty much teaching uh, my virtual assistant um, how to run the comps on it, showing my marketing manager how to run comps on it, who is also a licensed agent um, um, on it. And that's pretty much all we've done with it so far. Gotcha. One other thing I wanted to pull out of what Eric said earlier, he said that property values have been going up. Uh, a, another way to phrase what Eric has already told you is that um, when, when coronavirus hit, um, became a national emergency in mid-March, the 14th, or 15th, one of those days the market crashed, the other one it became a national emergency. And then March 27th, I wanna say is the day in Ohio that the shelter in place order was announced. What, what, what we've experienced in Cincinnati is that um, generally speaking, that made sellers nervous about putting their houses on the market. Uh, in part, maybe because they were concerned about property values, but also they didn't want people who might have the vid coming in their house and touching all their stuff. Uh, to to put uh, more analytics on that, it's 34%. Since mid-March, we have seen a 34% decline in listings hitting the MLS. We don't have good metrics for how buyer activity has changed, but we what we suspect uh, those of us who track these things is that buyer activity hasn't really changed at all from last year. We have this, we have a relatively similar number of, 
uh, of buyers who are interested, but there are a third fewer houses. So for every three houses that would have been available to a buyer, only two have listed, but there are still three buyers. Um, that's, that's what we've experienced. Very high demand, lots of multiple offer scenarios, breaking records for home sale prices in a lot of neighborhoods all over Cincinnati. Uh, demand is not exceptional by comp uh, year over year by comparison to last year or the year before, but supply is crazy low, and that's driving, that's driving values up. Yeah, Eric? and you, you're talking about with, uh, you know, poor metrics on the buying side of it. I completely agree. Other realtors I've been talking to as well is there have been few buyers on there that do not want to look into occupied homes either. Because the fact is, if somebody's living there, obviously, you know, they're worried about germs and stuff like that. So having a vacant home that has not occupied as well has definitely been the benefit for us as well um, for it. And having, helping a friend of mine too, like in, in um, Butler County area right now, in probably about five cities, if you have a buyer that is looking for like 230 and under, you're pretty much guaranteed being multiple offers with every property. That's just how it is. And it, as an investor, I'm looking at that thinking, okay, I know that no matter what, I can put either a completely rehab deal up here, and I know that if I'm like 250 and under, it's going to go off the market within, within probably three days maximum. The, one, the listing we just uh, put up in Anderson Township, that took about three days, and we got at asking price, no closing costs. They still wanted a warranty, so I couldn't, you know, I, I had to, you know, bite on that one. But, you know, but yeah, it was asking price, no closing cost, um, and a 30-day close. Um, another thing to keep note of as well is um, there is backlog going on with title companies and with mortgage letters as well. So I have been seeing, like, even conventional loans, like, asking for 40 days for closing on, so, on some lenders. That's great. Thank you, Eric. We have some questions here. When you, Eric, are offering on a deal that is off market, so not on the MLS, do you go in with your high, with, with your highest and best, what you, the most you're willing to pay, or do you come in lower than that expecting a negotiation? I mean, here's going to be the weird part. I'm, I'm not a big negotiator. I actually don't like negotiating. Um, so normally like, I'll, I'll go in a little bit lower than what I think I can, but it's not going to be much lower. So um, the deal that, or the, it's not going to be much for my highest and best. So the deal I just wholesaled off on there, he was asking $150,000 as I walked the property, you know, it, like he, he mentioned like waterproofing issues on it. Waterproofing isn't that much of a deal. We have an amazing company here that can take care of it. The problem is they're about eight weeks out right now. So a lot of waterproofing companies are about six to eight weeks now. So, you know, if that wasn't an issue, I probably could have given them that 150 and be fine. You know, but because of that, I negotiated down and there was also a question with the chimney. Once again, I really don't have that many uh, strong chimney people, but we can always get it inspected. So I put a 140 offer out there. You know, he came back with 148. We finally closed on 145 because I wanted to take a risk on the waterproofing part of it, knowing my only question was going to be about the chimney one. I eventually wholesale, uh, wholesale am going to wholesale that one for 160 um, to my friend. Now, did I know I was going to be able to wholesale it to somebody? No. But at 145, I was going to be comfortable, you know, with what I wanted to do. And so I went up for my original 140 offer. But in my opinion, it wasn't like I, I was trying to see how I could squeeze every dollar out of it. It just, you know, what made the most sense for this project and what, you know, issues knowing that it's a chimney and waterproofing, how much do I need to calculate for that extra time that I need to sit and wait for, for uh, these contractors to get in here. Awesome. Do you, uh, attendee question, do you, when, when it comes to your purchase and rehab budget, how do those two typically compare? Are you normally uh, out of that 70% is 20% of it rehab is 50% of it rehab? How are you, are you taking on larger rehabs 
uh, and paying less for the property or paying more for the property, taking on lower rehabs? What is your, what are you generally doing right now? Yes. I mean, um, because I'm in analytics on there, like the numbers are the numbers. So it's one of those where we took on a big project in Westchester. Uh, we paid $180,000 for it. It's going to be an $80,000 rehab. Now, granted, $80,000 rehab, at the end of the day, it's a unicorn house. So we can probably get about three seventy five dollars for it. And that's one of those where we're doing a three-way split with my contractor where I'm getting 33% of that, um, of it, because at the end of the day, we're still – going to net about 20 to 25,000. And it's an, and it's a unicorn property in an area where I think um, depending on how everything goes, it's going to be in a higher end suburb area considered, you know, considered one of the better schools uh, uh, based off report cards. I'm a licensed agent, so I can't really go into details about that, but it's one of those where there's high enough demand where, um, even under $400,000, it's going to be a high demand property, even if uh, things start uh, underappreciating. So at this point in time, I will take on higher rehabs as long as I see the value is going to hold. And it's a, it's a unique enough property that, you know, it's not going to be affected if, you know, uh, foreclosure, foreclosure start uh, ramping up again. So, and then obviously um, I'll take on, I'll pay higher for smaller projects if I think that it's in an area where a dated house can still sell relatively well. That makes sense. When it comes to the larger rehab projects, do you reduce your 70%? I know some flippers who say if the rehab is greater than the purchase price, I'll only pay 60% or or I'll only budget 60% of the ARV towards purchase and rehab because the rehab is more risky. Do you do anything like that? Not really, or not to not to a degree. Uh, based on that, it's one of those where I talk with my GC um, about it. We go to three way split. Um, we see what our net's going to be at the end of it. Are we are we okay with taking twenty thousand dollars each, or fifteen thousand dollars each, or twenty five thousand dollars each? We figure out we figure out what that net is um, on there. If we're okay with it, we go forward with it. Gotcha. Cool. Question. Uh, we've got a couple more questions here uh, from attendees. This one, I think, uh, is more directed towards me than Eric. Have you heard anything through the grapevine regarding the lifting of the eviction moratorium as of yesterday? Do you have any pending evictions? Personally, I do not have any pending evictions, but I know landlords who started, who who had eviction hearings uh, two weeks ago and then last week. And so evictions I know are happening again. I don't have any sort of official understanding of, of an eviction moratorium. I don't know that there ever actually was one technically on a national or even state level. Uh, but I believe the courts have opened up enough that evictions are being heard. I know landlords and property managers who are now getting work getting working through their backlog uh, of eviction filings from the last several months yeah my property managers are good at keeping bad news away from me because they know i have a red alert button um but essentially um the in all in our opinion on it we had uh two people that were affected one person's completely paid up on it um one person just never kept in contact with us um, throughout the entire process. And normally they were, you know, they weren't a trouble tenant. They kind of kept to themselves, but they were always spotty on paying rent, um, on it. And during COVID, I actually sold off that rental property because I paid about 90, 90 for it. And it was in an area where, um, you know, someone offered me, I think it was like 115,000 for it, you know, off market. So I was like, okay, sure. Why not? So, you know, I sold it off to them. I netted about, you know, $22,000 off of it. So, um, and, it, and they, and I even was up front and off with them like, Hey, this is a spotty paying tenant on it, you know? And they're like, Oh, well we, you know, your property manager told us it was on a, on a month to month, um, lease. Okay, perfect. So they're going to give them a 30 day notice and kind of do whatever they want with the property. <laughs> but other than that, like, um, the people that were affected on our end, um, you know, we, we uh, negotiated something with them. 
uh, we also, during COVID as well, even people that weren't affected, we, we gave them a reduced rent for, I think, March and April as well, you know, for it. And they just, and pretty much we just sent out a letter saying, we're not going to be doing late fees. If you do run into trouble, just keep in contact with us. We'll work with you. So. Great. Next question from Sandra. Are luxury homes or jumbo loan homes seeing more days on market or are they harder to close? And if so, will this trickle down to less expensive homes? Uh, and are buyers in the lower uh, home value ranges experiencing issues with qualifying and closing loans? Eric? I can't. I can't really answer on this because I don't, I'm not really in what's considered the luxury market of Cincinnati. Um, I do know it is longer days on market just because there are fewer buyers. But um, if you're like in a place like Blue Ash, Montgomery and stuff like that, you can have, you know, bidding wars up, up into about 500, $550,000. Um, you know, so I'm not in, I'm not in those luxury markets. I'm also not in the lower end markets as well, um, which is why I don't like do houses like under, under a hundred thousand dollars, um, for that reason. Um, so we have, so in, in our side, we haven't had issues with people qualifying for loans. We have had issues with people like, uh, an uptick of people like dropping out and just backing out at the property though. So our assumption is during this, um, some of the technology that's been coming out there for realtors is how to do virtual showings, uh, for their buyers. And so like, our assumption is they did a virtual showing on it, throwing in, they threw in an offer or they threw in a sight unseen offer onto it. And then during the walkthrough, they didn't realize they realized the property just wasn't for them. And so they used the inspection because it's just a back out. So we have seen an uptick in people backing out of properties. We haven't really seen an issue with people qualifying for loans though. Sandra, I can give you an answer as well. In the Cincinnati market, the luxury threshold is half a million dollars. $500,001 is considered luxury. Uh, part of the reason that is the threshold here is because when you get to property values above that, it is much more likely, I wish I had numbers for you, but much more likely that those are higher net worth individuals. And when you get to higher net worth individuals, you, um, a, a larger majority of them hold, hold more of their wealth in the stock market. And I'm not talking about every single one of them, but, but, but enough of them that when there is volatility in the stock market and other investing markets, uh, those people get patient they hold their breath. They decide not to make large moves when it comes to their primary residence because they don't know what's coming uh, when it comes to their investments. So yes, the luxury market is always slower in Cincinnati than below 500,000, but it is even slow for, for luxury in Cincinnati right now. Will that trickle down to less expensive homes? Likely not, because when you get below that 500,000 threshold, you're not looking at higher net worth individuals anymore, generally speaking. I could make some regional jokes about Cincinnati, but I won't. Uh, generally speaking, under half a million, you're not, you're not looking at higher net worth individuals, and so you're not looking at people who make home buying decisions based on uh, investing markets like, uh, like the stock market. When it comes to the ability to qualify for loans, the one th change that we have seen uh, is in credit scores. A, in order to get really favorable loan terms, you need a higher credit score than you did than you did previously. I will, uh, especially at lower purchase prices, uh, when you get below 150 purchase price, uh, you're going to see that people need better credit in order to be able to qualify for loans don't have the time to discuss why that is, but I hope I've given you a sufficient answer, Sandra. So thank you, Eric. Uh, you talking about how your business has changed through COVID. So how are you finding deals right now? You said about a quarter of them are coming from realtors. Where are the other three quarters of your deals coming from? And Right now, here's what I've actually been working on this year is um, as of a month and a half ago or two months ago, something like that, um, I finally have a virtual assistant 
um, who is actually on this call right now too, has, it has been absolutely amazing. Um, I'm very sporadic when it comes to marketing and I need to get, find somebody to get consistency on it. So I've in the past month and a half, I've got a marketing manager and a virtual assistant. So that way I can kind of give you much better metrics on it. Cause right now, essentially what I've been doing is stalking Facebook. Um, I'm on about, you know, five or six local investor pages, um, three mastermind pages and about two or three nationwide uh, pages. And because of the level of amount of time I'm on Facebook, um, I pretty much see like stuff like it immediately posted on. Um, I also see uh, check out leads for my local RIA as well. Um, and then I also bug, like I just make posts um, on my Facebook page. Um, one of the things I told you about is I'm probably the only one that, you know, made a deal off of a GIF. So what happened was like, I was in my office in Westchester and I was bored for whatever reason. So I was just like kind of typing up doing comps and stuff like that. So I pulled up a GIF of a, of the cat, just like, you know, doing the pause, hitting up, um, hitting on a keyboard and stuff like that. Just saying work, work, work. And a buddy of mine from high school, um, actually just messaged me like, Hey, are you still in real estate? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, yeah. Um, you know, my, my mother-in-law and father-in-law have this house in uh, Fairfield that they're just looking to, um, you know, sell off. Are you, are you interested in buying it? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, he saw the gift, laughed at it, started the conversation. We went and threw an offer, um, into it. I got it for 75. Um, yeah, I, I got, I, closed on it a little bit after that too. And then after a couple of weeks, um, you know, I couldn't tell if I wanted to keep it as a rental or sell it off. So I wanted to just test the market on it. So I just, uh, told a couple of my friends, you know, Hey, for a hundred thousand dollars, this is what we'll do, you know? And eventually, uh, you know, an agent that I was, uh, working with, um, found, found a, a agent that had a buyer for it that wanted to buy it and fix it up for their mother. So because I was paying two agent commissions on it, I, we got the, I think 105,000, we sold it for 105. So, um, and so that's how me posting a GIF, checking into my uh, Facebook page, you know, got me a deal. Um, I also were just randomly posting about, you know, what deals I'm doing on my personal page and on my business page. Um, which got another realtor um, to get to me to ask me about a deal in Middletown, which is normally Middletown's an area I don't work in, but I was looking for a deal during that time. So I was like, you know what? I'll take a look at it. I'm glad I did because it was technically a Middletown, but it was in a different school district, which made it much more impressive. So I went and got that one under contract. We threw in the offer for him. Um, and yeah, it was a pre foreclosure deal that we were able to, um, you know, sell it and even the seller got um some money at the end and then i learned that that agent actually never got paid any commission off of it because they thought they were just kind of doing a favor for a friend so even though i went and sold off that property to another investor i made sure to pay that realtor you know some money for bringing me the deal as well um because i learned that she did not get a commission on that side as well um and then yeah i got deals from the MLS um, through the Coldwell Banker. He also connected with a couple of wholesalers that brought us a couple off-market deals. We threw in our offers. Um, and yeah, it was just being very diligent on Facebook of keeping an eye on what's out there. And then, yeah, I've hounded about two or three uh, wholesalers, you know, one that was pre-COVID going to sell to me in Deer Park. Um, once the eviction moratorium hit, though, the person stayed in there. And I had to pretty much wait about three more months. Once that property came back active and the person left that property, I was then able to, um, I was the very first person that wholesaler came to for this deal. And I walked it, I uh, put in the offer for him and I pretty much gave him asking price because it's a great deal um, on it. And yeah, we bought that deal. And then another younger wholesaler was doing a joint venture with an out-of-state investor. Um, we went to take a look at the property as we were walking the property, I said, Hey, I appreciate, you know, you showing it to me. I know what you're asking for it. I just want to let you know, you know, I think they were asking 110 or something. Um, you know, I can only pay a hundred thousand dollars for, for this property. I just want to let you know that's my number. You have about 10 other people here. If for whatever reason, no one gives you the 110, I can give you the hundred thousand dollar number. So I at least always leave a house, whether it's wholesaler, whether it's retailer with an offer that they can consider. And after about three or four days, they came back to me 
you know, accepted my hundred thousand dollar offer. Nice. So uh, yeah, it's pretty much, I've just been on social media a lot and I've been finding out ways to filter out the negative parts. So that way I can just focus on looking for deals and it's been working for me. So yeah, Eric has turned the way that the rest of us waste time into the way that he finds deals. He's very diligent on Facebook at the poker table too. It takes him forever to make any decisions because he's not paying attention. He's too busy finding deals with gifts on Facebook. Um, question from James. What are quality local Cincinnati real estate investor Facebook groups you both use? When it James, it depends on what it is that you're looking for. When it comes to networking with other investors, getting advice, uh, finding people you may want to add to your team or that you may want to work with or getting a referral for a contractor, vendor, service provider, local store for flooring or hardware or light fixtures. The Best Ever Real Estate uh, Mastermind group on Facebook is the one that I go to, the one that corresponds to this meetup. Shameless self-promotion, but it's also where I go for uh, with, with all of my questions and where I go to give most of my answers. Eric, I know you're in all of the groups. Can you give us a few valuable ones for our attendees to look into joining uh, for finding deals potentially and also for uh, networking with other investors? Yeah. So some of them, some of them I can't name because they are part of masterminds. Um, cause I am in fortune builders and seven figure flipping altitude. The REI best ever one he mentioned is very great for referral networks on contractors and, um, other investor things. So the other one that's really good for, uh, contracting and networking is Cincinnati crushers. So Cincinnati crushers, and then there's a Dayton real estate networking group. I want to make sure I have that correctly. Um, keep in mind, I just checked how many groups I'm part of, apparently, and apparently I'm part of 146. Now, granted, they're not all real estate, though. Um, so, let's see here. Dayton Real Estate Investing Network. There's the official Bigger Pockets group. Cincinnati slash NKY Real Estate Investors Group. Contractors working with investors in Dayton, Cincinnati. And, the, and then this one is for real estate agents only. So just, a, just giving a heads up there. Um, buyer needs for Cincinnati real estate agents. They do, they do screen that very thoroughly. So if you are not an agent, you cannot be part of that group. That's just the way it is. And that's actually how I uh, got the rental property in Cheviot as well. That group is, it can be very valuable for realtors. It has come under scrutiny from the Cincinnati area board of realtors. Yes, they do look into these Facebook groups. Uh, that is a place where properties often get uh, posted just before they hit the MLS though, if you are a realtor, oftentimes you'll have, uh, you'll have, you'll have agents who are about, who, who have a listing agreement signed, who are getting it into the MLS. They put it on there first just to see what happens. And I believe that's where Eric got his uh, rental. Eric, when you're looking at the Facebook groups and, and Facebook in general, looking for deals, are any of them coming from the Facebook marketplace? I'll be honest. I really haven't looked too much in Facebook marketplace. Um, cause normally I see them first in the groups. Now I do know of other investors that have done really well in the Facebook marketplace. Normally what I've seen in the Facebook marketplace are the uh, people that no longer want to be landlords and have a vacant property on it. Um, but they're still asking way too much for their property. And because I don't like negotiating, if I see a price that, you know, I can't work with, I just kind of move on from it. I just don't say anything. Um, I, I don't have that mentality where I look at every property and try to make a deal out of it. If it's something that's close to my spectrum, 
then I'll take a look at it. If it's, if it's way out of where I would pay for it, I just kind of pass and move on to it. So. Gotcha. Um, so I do know people that have got deals on the Facebook marketplace. I also do know now, this is also another one you're going to be very careful of. There are Butler County, like buy, sell home, like garage sales and home sales um, sites out there. You know, if you do it and if you market yourself in a way where you're, you know, contributing to the group on it, you know, you can be able to post that we buy houses cash in there, but you can't just be spammy or, you know, slick salesman about it. So one of the things that I'm actually going to talk about marketing manager here soon is when we do purchase a property in those areas, one of the things we're probably going to do is do a garage sale of this is a new, pro this is a new property just purchased by turnkey renovations who buy houses cash. We were having a garage sale this weekend at, you know, this address, come and take a look at it. And of course, one of the marketing that we're going to do is we have a, a bandit sign in the house that we buy that says we buy houses. So as people are buying, leftover stuff from the houses that we purchased they're going to see the garage sale you know my acquisition manager whoever we put there can do a co-assignment of 50 percent net proceeds of whatever stuff they sell on it and we're getting neighbors into our houses to see the we buy houses sign and we're doing a you know shameless plug of we buy houses cash using our garage sale advertisement <laughs> have you had any deals come from that so far i i haven't started it yet Oh, gotcha. I know so you hired a marketing manager. This is all yeah. very new, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. We, like my, my virtual assistant and my marketing manager are about, you know, a month and a half in. So we're still in a lot of different training on it, but we're now like adding extra steps or adding extra like pieces to what we're building up. So, um, and it's, it's been really great working with everybody on there because everyone just you know, gels very well. They add in their own input, which um, Liana had some great ideas for when we were doing our uh, podio intake and stuff like that, that really helped us out um, on automating, you know, how these leads come in as well. So, um, and just listening to their ideas and just kind of figure out how we can make it work for everybody. I am closing on a single family off market, a single family flip style deal on Thursday, and it's likely going to be full of stuff. We got a guy who will come haul away for free if he thinks he can sell it at a flea market. I hadn't thought about doing a garage sale and just selling it all in the house and also telling people that we buy houses cash because we just bought this one. That's really clever. Yeah. And the thing I love about it too, like if you know, like you, it's one of those where bandit signs have been really scrutinized as well. So for people putting we buy bandit signs, they always get taken off on the weekend. I mean, no one's going to call a complaint about my bandit sign on a house I've bought. So <laughs> not to mention if you know that it's yours and, and it's not going to get stolen, it's a lot easier to invest, uh, get one of those nice metal frames, um, mm -hmm get uh you know those nice thick board uh placards that say the name of the company um we bought this house we'll buy yours or whatever that makes a lot of sense what yeah, you're it, it, go ahead i was about to say like um it, because a lot of things a lot of other marketing people are doing right now is direct mail marketing seems like everybody's just trying to put a lot of, it seems like it's a, it's a lot more cost to mail it out right now. So a lot of people are not seeing the return that they've seen in direct mail marketing. Um, so even though we're going to do that, a lot of our uh, marketing is going to be social media based on it, but it's also going to be pertaining to the property we just bought and being in the neighboring areas, as opposed to a five to 7,000 or five to seven mailer list as well. We would rather hit the neighborhoods are in, prove to people that we do buy houses in the neighborhood and then just kind of build up that credibility similar to how uh, agents farm their, uh, farm their markets. So is what we're going to be building towards. Gotcha. Are you using any social media platforms other than Facebook for real estate related stuff right now? Uh, I primarily stay on Facebook. Um, I do know that um we do have an Instagram that we kind of has ne have not really posted on. We got that back and up and up and running again with Instagram, but um, all of mine has been primarily Facebook. And then I'm trying to get better into LinkedIn, but I honestly like I completely forget it's there. 
So, and then also I have a problem with my iPad on how like um, a certain real estate form works on it. So I, got, I need to get better with uh, getting back into that form because there's a lot of great advice in there. I'm just not used to checking it out every day. So. Awesome. So we're wrapping this up guys. If you have any questions that have not been asked or answered yet, feel free to get them added in here. Eric, uh, you, I think you said this already, but just to recap, uh, how much, how many of the deals you've bought in the last, uh, since you started taking Facebook seriously, how many, how many of the deals that you've bought have come from scrolling social media on your phone? I would, it's going to be hard to tell because I know the address is on it. So, um, so we got home lawn on there. We got, um, Talawanda. We got, um, I'd have to say like seven or eight of them easily. So is there any way you could estimate the profit that you've made off of deals you got from scrolling Facebook in the last couple of years? In the last couple of years, uh, no. Um, but I could just say right now that this is going to be like, even with everything hitting us right now and taking a, uh, a loss on one of our properties, um, this is going to be a record year for me. So it's one of those where, um, if the numbers work out to what they are over there, um, I'm about 5,000 away from a 200 year. Wow. Yeah. That's big. That's good stuff. Yeah, it's it's definitely going to be a record year, both in volume and in net profit, um, based off these as well. And one of the things that kind of helped out as well is the fact is that you know, I specialize in fix and flip rehabs and stuff like that. It's not it's not my one niche. So as I have other deals going on, once I feel like I hit enough deals that I'm currently flipping, especially as we're trying to learn the new landscape of rehabbing, I still have the ability to wholesale them off. So I always make sure I keep that in my back pocket um, if need be that way, you know, yeah, that way I'm not wasting deals. So. Awesome. This is going to be a fun question. From, question from Jonathan. Several comments have been made about school districts, most interested in relation to multifamily but what do most people find to be the most favorable high level school districts? So we as realtors dance on <laughs> eggshells when we answer this question. Uh, with regards to multifamily inventory though, you're going to find that the vast majority of multifamily inventory, depending on the size that you're talking about, especially if you're talking about like two to four families, the vast majority of the inventory you're going to find is within Cincinnati schools for several reasons. One of them being that uh, the, the part of Cincinnati that is within the part of the metro statistical area that's within Cincinnati schools is the majority of the oldest neighborhoods in the city, there have been a few waves of multifamily development in the history of Cincinnati. Uh, coming out of the, uh, it's, it's usually after a war, actually. Um, and I, as I, I don't know what the, the correlation or causation is there, but uh, after the Civil War, uh, into the um, late 1800s, 80s, 90s, uh, and turn of the century, you saw a lot of stuff close to the river, close to downtown, uh, pop up multifamily wise. The next big push for multifamily was in the twenties. Uh, you saw a lot of, uh, duplexes, other, uh, other smaller, um, properties, but also apartment complexes that now have between 10 and 30, uh, units from the 20s. After that was right after World War II. The classic Cincinnati brick box fourplex that we've all seen hundreds of. In fact, you've seen hundreds of them in a row on the same street in some neighborhoods. Those were all built coming out of World War II. Uh, and they were building those, depending on the area, those kind of waned 
in the early 70s, actually. You'll find some of those that were built in the 70s, but from the late 40s into the 70s. So the neighborhoods where you're going to find that multifamily stock has a lot to do with where we were building then and, when, and where we were building multifamily housing. The vast majority of that is going to be found in Cincinnati schools. When it comes to the... Um, the school districts that get the the better letter grades on the state report cards, you're going. It's going to be more uh, difficult to find multifamily stock. It's not going to cash flow nearly as well. Uh, and in my experience, it will have been built uh, in the almost all of it, with the exception of neighborhoods like Wyoming, uh, which which have a lot of history, and Glendale also. Glendale by the way, is one um, horse-drawn carriage, one day's ride in a horse-drawn carriage away from the river, which is why there's so much old stuff in Wyoming and Glendale, because that's how far it took you to travel in a day in the 19th century. I know this is more nerd out than you were expecting, but <laughs> we're realtors. Deal with it. Um, out, outside of places like Wyoming and Glendale, you're looking at mostly duplexes that were built into subdivisions, uh, starting in the late 80s, actually, but mostly in the 90s and the early 2000s. Those don't cash flow as well, but they are newer. Uh, those kinds of floor plans are more in demand because you're talking about a side-by-side -side townhouse style duplex. They're usually like three bed, two and a half bath, and they both have a one car garage. It's a great opportunity for a house hacker who wants to get into a neighborhood that way, but also have rent to cover most or all of their mortgage. I know you guys came here to listen to Eric. <laughs> I, I, no, that I was that was great because I mean I, I loved listening, having the history lesson too. Because as you were saying that, that makes a lot of sense of how it was like after every war that yeah. you know these kind of came into play. But yeah, mine's going to be a lot simpler. Is essentially he talked about the the grading schedule that they had with the report cards. Normally, you can find that on the Cincinnati MLS like front page, and kind of do your own research on that with having to log in. Um, also, I, like I said, the group I mentioned where you have to be a realtor on as well, they're the ones that are always posting, hey, these buyers are looking for this school district. These buyers are looking for this school district. So you're like looking on, you're looking on that Facebook page. They're talking about these buyers. And then obviously, you know, people make the jokes of, oh, here's a unicorn, you know, trying to find that unicorn house in this school district at this price point. And then you have like 15 or 20 other comments saying the same thing. So you're, you're pretty much learning, you know, from these other realtors that have buyers that really want to be in a certain school district as well. And so that's where we're kind of, uh, you know, just penciling in, you know, those are the kind of school districts. And then obviously, you know, you go on the garage sale, Butler County uh, sites as well too. People will go back and forth on school districts as well. And because they don't have a license, they can freely talk about schools, um, you know, and kind of get more information that way. So there's the, you know, bookworm way of reading the report cards. And then there's just the social media nerd way, which is stock, you know, stock local groups, you know, see what people say about this school district. Um, and then obviously everyone's going to have an opinion about it because that's Facebook. So you'll get, you'll get plenty of opinions about uh, certain school districts. Jonathan has a couple of follow-up questions that I think are important. When you're looking at larger apartment buildings, 20 to 40 units, uh, how much does school district play a factor in, uh, in those properties? Uh, and how much does it play a factor with regards to the ability to raise cash flow? So I know uh, this is a great question. This uh, – I am a real estate professional. I don't have a job or a W-2 salary, but basically my full-time job is answering questions like that and finding deals like this. So uh, attendees, if you're really just here for single family flipping, that conversation may have run its course, but if you're still interested, <laughs> feel free to, uh, to, to, to stay tuned in for the next few minutes. So there are, two, there are two major considerations when it comes to, well, there's one major consideration when it comes to larger multifamily with regards to school district, and that is the number of bedrooms in the units. My experience has been that uh, with studios and one bedroom apartments, the vast majority of apartment buildings in the Cincinnati area with 20 to 40 units are all one beds or mostly one beds. For one bedroom apartments, 
the um, the school district is almost irrelevant. <sighs> Naturally, people who are renting one bedroom apartments are less likely statistically to have children who would be in the schools. What's most important is proximity to uh, to workplaces, proximity to employment, and proximity to entertainment, especially in higher rent areas, places where you can demand a premium, proximity to OTR, things uh, or Oakley, places like that. When it comes to the, um, w when it comes to multi, let's say you have a, a 30 unit where most of the units have two, maybe even three bedrooms. There is a, a huge housing shortage in Cincinnati when it comes to three plus bedroom apartments. Let's say you found it um, and, and you, you've got the unicorn 30 unit, all two and three bed apartment buildings. Your, uh, your capacity to raise rents and increase cash flow, regardless of school district, still has more to do with how the current owner and current manager are running the property. How far behind market rent have they gotten? Uh, or how far behind market rent have they, did they start when they bought it? Uh, how much deferred maintenance is there? Are you going to have, uh, it's, it's got a lot more to do with that than it has to do with school district. When you're talking about increasing NOI, increasing cash flow, it's more about, um, it's more about finding opportunities to uh, where properties have been man have been rented under market by the current ownership and management, and 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 figuring out what it will take and making sure it's an um, it's within budget to get to um, to get those properties up to market rents. That matters more than school districts. So. Sorry, I didn't directly answer your question. I think I said that the que that I hope I gave you answers that were valuable, though. Somewhat. <laughs> it somewhat matters. I mean, school districts would always matter in some in some capacity when it comes to real estate. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, school district matters when it comes to how much rent you can charge for a two or three bedroom apartment. Your ability to increase cash flow, increase the net operating income of a property, though, has more to do with the margin between current performance and market rents than it does with school district. Um, Sandra Morrison has a recommendation of uh, greatschools.net. She says she used to do a lot of international uh, relocations for larger employers, P&G, HP, GM. That makes sense. Uh, when, when, when you're talking about international relocations for major employers, you are talking about single family homes uh, and you may be getting into that luxury space, but there will be a lot of those that are nowadays going to be 300 to 500. Uh, and when it comes to demand for housing between three and 500,000, you will see that the demand is greatly impacted by a uh, school district. And you will see that if you go to the state of Ohio's letter grade reporting on school districts, uh, the demand correlates with those letter grades. Am I sufficiently politically correct, Eric? Are the, are the realtor police going to come get me for saying that? I, I, think, I think we stayed relatively safe um, okay, good. discussing this. Uh, this is another excellent. This is another excellent land, uh, owner operator of apartments question from Jonathan. Jonathan, you did such a great job of answering are, questions that are there's totally no off questions. topic. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, question is, uh, how challenging have you found tenants in Cincinnati paying rent on time, um, non-COVID? Uh, imagine completely varies by neighborhood. Anywhere particularly challenging. Jonathan, my experience uh, has been more acute post-COVID. Uh, I, I spend uh, a lot of time, as much time as I can, on the phone with landlords, property managers, owner-operators looking for deals. Uh, and almost entirely, across, no, the single most important factor in whether or not rents have been collected uh, since COVID is property management, hands down. It's not neighborhood. It's not 
Um, it's not rent rate. It's not type of apartment type of unit. Is it a house? It all comes down to management and the, and the relationship between the tenant and the person who is managing that property, whether it is the owner or not. Uh, the only people I know who are really struggling after COVID live out of town and have uh, property managers here locally that I will not name. Uh, I know some property managers here in town who have not had any trouble, pro professional property managers who manage for other people uh, who haven't had any trouble collecting rents with COVID because they had a better job of establishing a right relationship between themselves and the tenants in the buildings that they manage. The vast majority of owner operators I know who are full all the owner operators I know who are full-time in real estate, people like myself who buy, own, manage, and sell real estate for a living, all of us that I know have collected 100% rent every month because we make sure we are on top of that relationship with our tenants. And those of us who, I would like to consider myself good at this, those of us who are good at this, uh, Dick, dictate is a strong word, but uh, have been managing the tenant relationship from day one. I'm in the process of hiring my first full-time employee in property management. Um, and, and one of the things that I kept, I, I kept dialing in was that our relationship with our tenant become, begins when they click on the Zillow link and become a prospect in our CRM. As soon as they do that, we are establishing a relationship with a tenant and we need to, we need to do that right. So the people who are establishing good relationships with their tenants, hundred percent rents collected April, May, June, July, August. Uh, the, the places where your, you, your building and your tenants just become a number on a spreadsheet to a big property management company. Those guys have been struggling because they haven't had the relationship to get the rent paid. Uh, when tenants found out that they could coast for what they thought might be a few months without paying rent and without getting evicted. Any nuggets that you can expand on that is the next question of like examples of maintaining and establishing that relationship. Yes. Now we're going to interview you, Slocum. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We've gone, we've gone from single family flips and, you know, sitting on your butt in your office on Facebook, finding deals to, how to manage apartments through through COVID. But the great question. Uh, I'll tell you, Jonathan, as uh, a, a full-time owner operator uh, and, and real estate um, investor friendly realtor, the, the first book I gave my first hire in property management, um, meaning that I'm building a property management business for the sake of managing my rentals and she works for me. The first book I gave her to read was the book on rental property management by Brandon and Heather Turner. You are not going to get, in my opinion, at least high powered tools, checklists, systems for property management from that book, but you are going to get good attitude for being an owner operator or a property manager. Uh, it, it helps you understand the nature of the landlord tenant relationship and the things that you can and cannot take for granted. For example, I am a full-time real estate agent uh, as, as, uh, as well as an owner operator. In sales, follow-up is critical. Uh, and when and when Eric is chasing deals, uh, they're not always going to answer his first message or he's not always going to get the deal done the first time. He always gives them a number before he leaves the house, though. Like you said, I can't do the 110, but I can do the 100. And I want to make sure you know that I can do the 100 because I want to be the one that you call back when you can do 100 uh, and, and follow up um, pleasant persistence. It's the total opposite when it comes to my rental prospects. Uh, they the vast majority of people are just clicking in Zillow or Zumper, I guess is a thing. A lot of my leads are coming from Zumper now, apartments.com. I don't do Craigslist, but the rest of them, they just click to give us their info and to request more information. We reach out once call text message through the CRM. And then you got to get back to us. We're not going to hunt you down. We're not going to chase you down. We're going to, we are going to come correct and we're going to do what we say we're going to do. Uh, and that, 
And that establishes with this person who has done nothing more than click a link that had my address on it. We begin establishing the relationship with our tenants there that we come correct. We will do what we say we're, we are going to do. Um, but we are not going to chase you. You need to come to us. If there's something that you need, if there's an issue or a concern, if there's something that you want, you got to come to us. We're not going to chase you for the rent. You're going to bring it to us. Eric, anything to add? That's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, uh, uh, I'm glad I've had the opportunity to answer some good questions. Jonathan, thank you for asking such good questions. All right, awesome. If that is it, I think we are... <laughs> I think we are, we are getting good and wrapped up. Uh, Cody, if you didn't get a sound bite out of Eric saying I'm probably the only person in this group who's ever bought a house with a GIF, then <laughs> that's got to be the sound bite for this, for this one that gets recorded. For those of you who are not familiar, um, this will, the, the recording of this webinar will be available in the Facebook group. It will also be available soon on YouTube. Uh, links, links to that uh, and links to other helpful information will start coming to you from your registration for this webinar. Thank you for coming, checking us out. Our next webinar will be on the last Tuesday of September, he says, as he is stalling, which is the 29th. September 29th will be our next uh, best ever meetup. Unfortunately, I'm not likely to be in person. Um, the, the guest speaker we have for September 29th will be announced soon. Thank you all again for coming. Uh, thank you for interviewing me, Slocum. And yes, Eric, Slocum. thank you for being here. <laughs> Absolutely. Glad uh, you, you've added a lot of value to the people who came in to listen and ask questions. Appreciate you being here for sure.